Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. Ty Hildebrand here, Dan Rubenstein over there. SolidVerbal at gmail.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We are on Snapchat. We are on iTunes at iTunes.com slash SolidVerbal. If you came here for college football, now might be a good time to put down the iPod. Maybe go do something else with your day. We've worn you for iPod. weeks now. iPod. We're going way yeah. back. Oh. With our That's subject true. matter. So let's go way back with our technology as well. Put down that Diamond Rio. That's right. Put down your Zune, whatever <laughs> it is you're doing. We've got a different topic at hand. We've warned you for weeks now, Dan. Yep. At long last, it's the emo and pop punk show. Yeah, it's the deep dive. I cannot stress this enough. Thank you very much for your download. If you're not at all interested in emo and pop punk from like 1998 to 2006, we will not be offended. Please stop. Move on with your life. And my God, download Bill Barnwell's podcast, The Bill Barnwell Show on ESPN.com. He does all sorts of on and off topic football stuff with the NFL. And we are very happy to bring him aboard, Ty. Welcome, Bill. How are you? Guys, I'm great. Uh, I have to admit, though, I prepped like an hour of college football stuff. So I don't know if I'm going to be great. <laughs> Do you see, Bill, do you see a loss on Washington's schedule on paper? I'll tell you what, I looked it over. Yeah. And, and you know, I just went game by game and I said, well, is this a win or a loss? I don't see one. I, I don't really understand. <laughs> I, I kind of wish I did, but I just, it just seems like it, chances are it's going to be a perfect season. Our, our podcast is a giant black cat mm -hmm. in Seattle, Washington right now. I don't know what you're talking about, Ty. I do not know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, that, must a, that must be a podcast thing that I'm not aware of personally. <laughs> Um, okay, so right off the bat, yep. this is an era that we are talking about with emo and pop punk, and we'll we will define what those words mean or don't mean to us. But finally, I think generally speaking, for each of us, because I think we each it, we each graduated from high school and college in subsequent years. Ty, you're you're Penn State class of two thousand four, correct? I am Oregon class of two thousand five. Bill, you are Northeastern. Correct. Oh, classes, six? Of, classes of a six, but it's a five year school. So I got, oh. got there in 01. Gotcha. Okay. So this, so we align pretty much perfectly. Very much so. And I, I would say, I would argue that this is prime music listening time. Ty, do you agree? Sort of late high school into college. That's when we all sort of come into our own as emotional adults. Yeah. It's a very volatile <laughs> stage in life. By the way, we talk about 18 to 22 year olds all the time. That's true. On this show. So I think we know both personally and just from afar how volatile it can be. So to answer your question, yes, a lot goes on within like this five to eight year period in one's life. So my first question is, Bill, yes. where, where are your strengths? Where are your blind spots in terms of we'll call it the scene because the scene encompasses pop punk, emo, hardcore, ska, a little bit of indie rock, that kind of so so where do you gravitate towards genre wise? Now, are you asking me where do I gravitate towards genre wise in this time period or currently? In this like, looking time back. of bands that arguably produce their best work in this general time period. Mm -hmm. where, where is the vent? Where's the Bill Barnwell Venn diagram of musical taste? I'm leaning way more towards the emo and indie side of things. Okay. I would, I would say that, uh, like sort of that, that sort of weird murky zone in between the two where like mm -hmm. death cab and dismemberment plan. Sure. Are, like that's where I saw it's like, Oh, this is extremely, my thing like this is where I ended up as like this is the pinnacle for me now I took different paths to get there I went through all those different genres except for I would I, I don't really think I was much of a ska guy at any point um, I really feel like ska is more like it's not a northeast thing and I'm sure there's oh, like true. there are people who are like, like it's kind of like you know college football it's not necessarily a northeast thing I feel like it's it, it's more of a uh, location based thing for me and I was in the wrong location for Scott <laughs> Ty, where where is your Venn diagram? Because, and I'll get to mine, Ska was actually kind of an entry point for me, being okay. going to high school in Southern California. So, hey. Ty, what is your Venn diagram? You know, what what sort of direction of those subgenres, where sure. do you fall? Yeah, I, I think, and we talked about this before, Dan, 
I think I trend a little poppier Mm -hmm. on the pop punk scale, if there is such a thing, and probably more on the tail end of the whole pop punk movement around the time when you saw this weird fusion between emo and pop punk, like the emo pop, as it were. Sure. Uh, So things like Fallout Boy. Um, I had a hard time as we got into like the 2008, 2009 time period trying to distinguish between true pop punk and boy bands with guitars and distortion. Right. That whole thing was like a whole sub movement for me. Like trying the to click figure that five. Out. You're, you're big on the click five. The time. click five to me is like <laughs> the ultimate, the ultimate like oh, bellwether, man. the gray area between true pop punk and, and going boy band with guitars and distortion. The other thing I'd say very quickly, and Bill, I hope you don't think I'm a monster for this. Dan has, war- Dan has warned me a little bit that you might feel that way, but in the interest of full disclosure, one of my blind spots is is sort of albums. All right, and and I'll 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 justify it by saying I know a lot of the big ones. All right, saying so, you know, like Enemy sure. of the State, Enema of the State, excuse me, uh, Dookie, <laughs> Bleed American, Ocean Atlas, like all the big ones that are pop culture things I I know about, but. My listening experience was probably tied more to the Napster and Scour and LimeWire era in that I didn't go to the music store to buy the actual CDs. I was much more apt to download individual songs. And so just, just from that standpoint, that was kind of the ecosystem in which I listened to a lot of this music. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's sort of a time frame thing too, right? Yeah. In that it sounds like you were listening to it in, you know, sort of towards the tail end of the period we're talking about. And that was a much more prevalent thing at the time. Um, I mean, I, the way, the ways I got, I was made aware of music. And I guess I just, like my entry point into all of this was I was a Radiohead fan and Radiohead took me to the Pixies because Pixies influenced Radiohead. And then there was a Pixies comp. Uh, like a, a tribute to the Pixies comp in 2001, I want to say, mm-hmm. that had... Like, was it called really, Where Is My Mind? It's called Where Is My Mind. That is correct, Dan Rubenstein. <laughs> uh, it had like Weezer and Eve 6 and Real Big Fish. And I was like, eh, not really into this so much. But then it had The Get Up Kids and Braid and Promise Ring and Not A Surf. And that got me into those bands. That was my entry point into a lot of those bands. But then the next step was uh, Northeastern had a Direct Connect network. Mm-hmm. Which was basically a like a uh, a file sharing service that was only for Northeastern students on Northeastern IP addresses, which meant that the download speed was incredible. It was it was used so frequently that it shut down the Northeastern internet several times. Like it was banned for a while. Like people weren't allowed to use it. But like you would download an album in literally seconds, and you could see what everyone else on the network had. So like I would look for, you know, if I wanted to find a Promise Ring album there would be like 25 copies of it on the network and I'd have it in 10 seconds if I were so inclined. So it was incredibly easy to find full albums. So I think that's why I sort of gravitated towards listening to full albums. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm with Bill there just because I thought I got so into specific bands over tracks that I wanted to hear as much of the bands as possible. Not to say you don't, Ty. Yeah, no, uh, and I think that's fair. I, I, I won't attest to mine being the conventional route. I think right. most people are tuned in more to the albums i told solid wife kate about this she looked at me like i had two heads so no. <laughs> it's it's fine I'll, I'll deal with it dan let me spin it back to you yeah your entry point into this so-called market where is your venn diagram so yeah. i i sort of go between emo and pop punk pretty evenly uh, a little hardcore stuff like i got into thrice for a little while and that's not super hardcore but it's a little harder uh okay. finch i was gonna say finch yeah finch yeah, was maybe finch was pretty good Maybe a hot water music, perhaps? Uh, a little bit of hot water music. They did a nice split with the Alkaline Trio, which I know they you're not be. wildly keen on. Uh, we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. But my entry point was interesting since I grew up in Southern California and a couple of the huge labels were in Southern California at that time. So drive through Records and Vagrant, mostly. I think Vagrant's down in Santa Monica, or at least was. Uh, a friend of mine in high school, good friend, intern for drive through Records. They called their interns and gave them cards that said, drive through Bitch. <laughs> like that was a thing. I went well, in with him one day and just helped, you know, with mail order stuff or whatever. Ended up walking on the back of the owner because he had a bad back. And that's like a thing that people did. Um, but when I was there, Newfound Glory was sleeping on the couch. They were oh, just wow. around. Um, so the first sort of entry point, I liked some ska stuff. I really liked Less Than Jake early on. My first show, I think I went to a hippos show, which was fun. The Glass House in Pomona. 
But the real entry point was comps, compilations. And drive through one was You'll Never Eat Fast Food Again. And it was early drive through bands that aren't necessarily... I think Newfound Glory and Midtown were on there, but a bunch of bands people probably don't remember uh, were on there. And it was a there was a liner note jacket full of stories about people like jacking off on cheeseburgers. Like, <laughs> that was the entry point for me. So then I liked RX Bandits and bands like that that sort of begat other bands, so Midtown and Newfound Glory and stuff like that. So really the entry point was the drive through stuff. And from there, going to college, that really opened everything up. And as Bill mentioned, having that network connection and sharing on iTunes and going on IRC and Audio Galaxy. Oh, and- IRC. My God, oh, I forgot I about that. all about IRC. Yeah. So, that was, so it was Ska going into the sort of drive through bands, which were very poppy. Uh, you know, the Mark Trombino produced albums. That's what really got me. Okay. Can I um can I can I make a my own sort of uh heretical? Is that the right way you say that? Uh, maybe. Say that? It may be. Okay, I'm happy we can move past it. That's fine. Uh love Vagrant. Vagrant is definitely my sort of like Vagrant like 2002 is oh, extremely, yeah. extremely my stuff. I was never a, a big fan of a lot of bands on drive through. Right. And I understand that. I think drive through it was very much bands that were like a gust of wind from the radio. Yes. Like if things broke correctly. So Newfound Glory was a drive through band. Dashboard was initially a drive through band. They released Swiss Army Romance before they went to Vagrant. Mm-hmm. Um, our expandants were more ska. I think they, they really sort of started out as like a fun ska poppy. I know Phoenix TX was on drive through. So yes. unless you were fans of those types of bands that were so directly influenced by Blink, then you were either all in on drive through or you were moving on to sort of more thoughtful type music and that's fine. Yeah. But even, even like your, you know, your something corporates, for mm-hmm. example, never really a big fan. I have to admit. Oh, love something corporate. Mm. I can a see California that. band, Dan. Yeah, it's absolutely. And he's gone on to an, a couple more bands, Jack's mannequin and some weird name band situation that he has now. But yes, I mean, I was what 18 in Southern California and it was the starting line midtown, um, later on, I didn't really listen to too much Hello Goodbye bands like that. So if you were in that mind frame, if you were in that mindset, it was it was fantastic. How do you fall on those bands, Ty? Because it was like it was basically like a direct line. If there, it's like a speed train, a musical speed train between Southern California and New Jersey. That's basically, basically what it is. Yeah, I'm looking at a list here of some of the bands on drive through just mm-hmm. to sort of jog my memory. And of course, Newfound found glory. One of the things we're going to get to in a little bit is, you know, some of the, some of the songs that if we were going to put together our own EP, which mm-hmm. was impossibly difficult. It was to really, do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I'm looking at some of the bands here that jump out at me, obviously dashboard. I want to hear the story, by the way, of the concert you guys went to. That's Maybe great. we can go there next when we talk about concerts and whatnot, but right. you know, dashboard Finch was a little too hard for my liking, but they had some good stuff. Newfound glory, obviously, you know, was was one of the founding fathers. Starting line, best of me. How could you forget that? Otherwise, though, not a whole lot here that I really latched onto. Okay. Um. Again, I I think I kind of came after if I were to try and draw up my own Venn diagram. Bill, let me ask you this: sure. What was the band, and when did it happen that yeah. you went from sort of liking the the music and liking all sorts of these bands to like, oh, I am a super fan and I need to learn everything about this band and I need to read every interview and I need to learn about their influences and I need to download demos. Was there a band like that for you that drew you into like the full nerdiness? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I'm sure there was at the time, but thinking back, it the closest thing would probably be Get Up Kids. Okay. I feel like. Uh, I mean, I love the Get Up Kids. I, I have no, like, I'm not looking back and saying oh, I shouldn't like that. Like that is great. Mm-hmm. Th- that those albums were great, and it was more like my life began to become surrounded by people who were like that, like mm-hmm. people who were super into bands like that, and so it felt very natural to dork out about a band like that or bands like that in the same vein. It's so, like when I went, to, I moved to Boston for for college in September 2001, like four days after 9/11, drove mm-hmm. up to Boston. Same, yeah. I mean, you didn't go to Boston. No, not Boston, Eugene, Oregon. But yes, it was a few days right after 9 11. Yeah. yeah. And so I got there, and for the first two weeks, I was kind of like, like I had, I didn't have a roommate. I was like in my, my apartment by myself. I was dating, like, like I met a girl and started dating her. Uh, but I was, 
I wasn't really like listening to any music and I was kind of just, you know, wasn't really doing anything. And then I went to a Kaiju Big Battle show, which I have all kinds of stories about. I worked for them for a brief while. It's very strange, but there was a mix of performing arts and wrestling. And they would <laughs> they would have they would have like indie-ish bands open up before the show because they were from they were all art school kids and they had sort of hookups there. But they had like Savi Fav open up and bands of that nature. Mm-hmm. But uh, the show I went to, the show I went to was Piebald opening up for uh, for Kaiju Big Battle. And I'd never even heard of Piebald before. And it became very clear to me very quickly that Piebald was the most important band in the city of Boston at the time, which seemed very strange to me. Right. And then I got super into Piebald, even though I didn't really even like Piebald that much at first, just because everyone I knew liked Piebald. And so the get-up kids were like Piebald, but sort of a more intense thing where it was like, okay, I have to find out their whole discography. I have to find out why there's six different versions of uh, a new fan interest in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like it was just... It was just that that was the first band I remember really being that hardcore about at the time. Ty, do you have a band? I know you talked about more singles and being later in later on in the uh, in this era. But was there a band that you're like, I need to learn everything about this band. I'm willing to drive to see this band. I want to see if I can download demos, anything like that. Was there that Pro- band for you? Yeah, probably Green Day. I think Green okay. Day probably falls into that category, though I didn't drive to see them. They were interesting and they were different. I remember vividly what kind of got me into this whole thing or at least tuned into the type of music Mm -hmm. i had i had a cousin who was you know a a a little less straight laced than i was growing up and he had a dookie poster on his wall (laughs) i remember seeing this like wow this is this is sort of risque it looks risque what what is this thing and from there i kind of you know found out a little bit more about it and green day was interesting you know they were they were one of the first real punk bands of our generation well, and they broke through yeah yeah and they broke through and obviously they're still around in some capacity but um yeah I, I think for me green day is really what drew the initial interest and it all sort of spiraled out from there yeah i think so initially for me the band was weezer i was on Very weezer fair. message boards i was on and this was in the era like before the green album after pinkerton which is pretty easily argued as one of the sort of founding fathers or influences of a lot of these bands that sort of resulted, uh, sort of found themselves with the emo quote unquote success. Um, but I got way into it. They released demos. There was called the summer song, the SS 2K, the summer songs of 2000 that eventually sort of turned into the following album, not the green album. Um, so, and they would release demos all the time. They had their like roadie ran the site, Carl with a K, um, and got way into Weezer. But then, the entry point into nerding out over bands more in this scene, because I know Jimmy Eat World opened for Weezer. Um, yes. It was, I think, when I found your favorite weapon in 2001, Brand New's first full album, and then the whole thing with them feuding with Taking Back Sunday, quote unquote feuding, um, and they released a split, I remember, with a, with a cover of a, God, who is the band from Idaho? I'm blanking on it. Oh, um, I should know this. Uh, Built to Spill. They did a Built to Spill cover on a on a split that was great. And for me, sort of following and learning about Jesse Lacey and Brand New and going through what I was going through. And Bill, you mentioned you started dating somebody your freshman year of college. I got dumped cross country to start my college life. Um, and so it was the greatest possible thing to happen <laughs> to my fandom of this type of music. So brain, I had a disc man. And I must have played Brand New's Your Favorite Weapon on it 10,000 times and also started playing this music on a radio show that I got at the beginning of my freshman year. So it all sort of coalesced, no pun intended, right. to it's a band tie, it's a band, right? Uh, into this sort of stew of emo. So that, that was sort of my, my big deep dive. Initially. I mean, how, how bad did it get for you, though? Did you ever go I mean, to like Hot Topic? I mean, what are we talking about? No, here? no, no. Hot Topic is for frauds. I told you that, Ty. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I would, I mean, I would order merch online. I would go to shows in Portland, which was like an hour and a half away. I built up a library digitally, obviously. Uh, I went I to Face know. Music. I, I mean, I, I've, I've seen the CD collection in your room. Oh, yeah. The photos of it. You have an actual tangible digital collection. Or, or, or oh, no, physical a physical, collection. Yeah, yeah. I have a big physical collection of CDs that I would go to face the music, rest in peace, in Eugene, Oregon, and buy a bunch of CDs. So I have a ton of CDs, but it was also this time where you could discover so many bands yes. through digital means sure. that 
uh, I, it really built up for me. Let me let me ask so, you a, let me ask you another really important question. I know you know at least on an average level how to play mm-hmm. the acoustic guitar. Yeah. Did really? you did you buy the oh, guitar yeah. before, during, or after this time period? So the quick version of my musical history is I rented <laughs> a bass and took bass lessons my senior year of high school. So I learned a little bit of muscle memory there, and then bought the acoustic guitar. Probably right at the beginning of college or something in LA and brought it back to me, back back to Eugene, excuse me, with me. Um, And I don't think it was an accident, but it's not like I was playing to become the new dashboard, but it was, (laughs) it was definitely a thing that was therapeutic. I see. I bought a guitar during this time period because I had a friend who was sort of into it and way better than Uh me. And being so this was kind of the movement at the time, musically, at least for me, it was it was a license to try and play some of this stuff. And I remember trying with horror at some <laughs> point early on in my lackluster musical career mm-hmm. to do this weird like drop C tuning that Dashboard tried with some of their drop stuff. D, drop D. No, this was drop C. Drop C. Okay. Some sort of weird C tuning, which yes. I found on uh, Ultimate Guitar Tabs or whatever that Obviously. site was. And um, that was pretty much the beginning and end of my musical prowess. <laughs> Bill, did I, you play? I, I have two guitar stories that are relevant okay. to this spot. I owned one, was not a player, but owned a guitar uh, through a party at my apartment or my dorm sophomore year. Had a guitar in my room, did not know how to play it. But uh, a girl at this party suggested that she would sleep with me. Huh? But I, I was not trying to sleep with this person, but she offered to sleep with me if I could play Every Rose Has a Storm by Poison on the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> to which I spent... I spent the next 10 minutes desperately trying to figure out how to play. <laughs> hurry, hurry, <laughs> hurry, hands. It can't, it can't be that hard, right? It can't be. It's like, it's a pretty slow song. Sure. Uh, it, turn, it turns out I did not know how to play it. And I did not end up oh. uh, uh, having any interaction with that person. Um, the other thing which made me stop playing was that I was living with a bunch of guys in a band, at the, mm-hmm. an emo band, coincidentally at the time, a very something corporate-y sort of band. Uh-huh. And I, I had like, my bedroom was like, next to the living room. Like it was like basically I like shared a double door with the living room. And uh, my roommate was making out with a girl on the couch. And I was kind of like, I was trying to sleep and I didn't really want to listen to them. And I didn't think, I didn't think they thought I could hear them, but I could. So I started trying to play the guitar just to sort of like drown them out. (laughs) Yeah. I started playing the guitar to like, kind of like, you know, maybe get them to go to their room and kind of leave me alone. But then they started making fun of how bad I was at guitar, and I didn't think I could hear that, and I could, and that was even more of a killer. So then I was like, okay, I'm done playing guitar. Wow. Wow. Early retirement. Yeah. Who knows where it would have went? (laughs) Ty, did you you travel to see any bands when you were in college, in uh, in state college? No. Um, Wow. I mean... Got to support the scene, Ty. I know. I know. I know. I wasn't uh, very adventurous as far as road trips go. Um, I, I can tell you about a memorable experience about okay. seeing a show okay. at the Bryce Jordan Center at Penn State. It wasn't a, a traveling type of situation, but I saw Good Charlotte, I think, <laughs> in 2003. Yes, you can laugh. It's fine. Can we mute, Ty? No, no. I saw, <laughs> we got discount tickets. This is pop punk. Okay. Now, it, it technically counts. We saw uh, Good Charlotte, and it was like 2003 or 2004. And, I mean, Good Charlotte would never be confused for any kind of musically gifted band like they weren't brand new right they just kind of played the power chords and joel madden belted it out as best he could he was sick during the show he came Mm -hmm. out he said right from the very beginning i'm sick the entire show he was spitting literally Mm -hmm. spitting on the stage and we had elevated seats where we could see every single time he did it (laughs) which was disgusting they were all it was the worst show i've ever seen in my life and my lasting memory from that show is that something corporate actually opened for them. Nice. And totally overshadowed Good Charlotte. I never listened to Good Charlotte again. So wow. I I interviewed... Ty, are you familiar with the movie life? I know Bill is. Yeah, sure. Oh, very, very uh, so. Interviewed the movie life when they opened for Good Charlotte in Portland. And so I used my radio show as a vehicle. I wanted to go to these shows anyway. And by booking interviews with these bands, you just would email their manager, whatever email was on the website. Yeah. So I interviewed a ton of these bands and they were all pretty much, they were just all kind of nice dudes from New Jersey or Long Island. (laughs) The majority of them Uh, interviewed Adam Lazara from Taking Back Sunday, uh, Midtown, Starting Line, all these bands that came through either Portland or Eugene. 
yeah, I the biggest distance I traveled, I believe, is before college started. I went and saw the Vagrant Across America tour. So that was Saves Day, Alkaline Trio, Dashboard Confessional, some sort of combination thereof, some Reggie in the full effect all throughout California. That was my like high school graduation gift that I asked for was basically gas money to go see these bands. Oh no, that's very sad. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It was a good time. I'm sure you enjoyed yourself and I, I would have enjoyed it as well. I was 18 and thus went to a strip club for the first time in my life on that oh. vacation oh. Oh. in San Francisco. Yeah. It was not oh. great. It was I not know. great. It's in a true life. coming of age story. Yeah. <laughs> in a matter of words, matter of speaking, it I, was. I had a very failed sort of attempt to go see an emo band, a uh, not very prominent band uh, called the Vermicious Nid, who my friend downloaded their album from somewhere and it was incredible. It was just like the, it was very sort of, it was like a, a sort of a, a more intense, sort of more attention filled minus the bear, mm -hmm. which is, I'm super in. That's like, it, <laughs> it, I really liked it. And they were from, Somewhere in Ontario, I want to say Brampton, Ontario, like a not like a part of Ontario that's not Toronto. So very much did not know what it was. And it was I was living in Boston. I didn't have a license, but I played it for a friend. and He liked it, and they were going to break up, and they were playing a farewell show in Brampton. And I thought, oh, it'd be really cool to go to the show. And I I had no money or any way to anywhere to stay, so I emailed the bands, and I'm like, hey, is there any place to stay if if we come see the show? And it's like, and they were so excited. They're like, oh, like you know, we'll put you up. You can come sleep, wow. you know, and whatever. And then the day before, my friend bailed and I couldn't go. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. So, Ty, yeah. you, didn't, you didn't tour. You didn't follow a band. You didn't travel long distances. You didn't drive to, like, New Jersey to go see a band. Right. There was no almost famous story here. No almost famous story. But yeah. this is also... There are so many huge albums that we now look back on as being sort of quintessential. Sure. Yep. So, to you, in this era... What are, and granted, you're not an album person necessarily, but you can sort of recognize eras of these bands. Yeah. What do you look at now as saying like these albums or the, this era has sort of withstood the test of time that you would sort of hand a stack of CDs to somebody about these bands? Yeah. I mean, I'd probably go in a few different waves. I mentioned Dookie by Green Day. That, that kind of set the scene in many regards. 94. Yep. Um, as you kind of progress through, obviously, Enema of the State by Blink-182. I'm not it's exactly uh, giving away any trade secrets here, but largely regarded as one of the most prominent pop punk albums of all time. Do you think you can recite the track listing? How, uh, many, how many tracks from Enema of the State do you have in front of you, in your head? In my can head? you do it in order? Uh, I can't do it in order, no. Okay. How many? The, there are there 12, were like tracks 12 tracks. 12 tracks. Uh, there was... Obviously, Adam song, yep. aliens exist. Number seven. All yep. the small Three. things. That is number eight. Uh, going away to college. What's number my four. age again? How could I forget that one? Five. Yeah. Uh, Mutt, which is an underrated song. Love top, Mutt. Top four on that album. Wow. Um, Don't leave me. Two. Dumpweed. That's yeah. number one. The Did old dumpweed. Uh, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. Um, there's a party song. And then there are like, what's that? Two or three that I can't remember off the top. I think of my there head. Were, yeah. You're missing uh, Dysentery Gary. Yep. Uh, that song sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible you're missing, song. You're missing Wendy Clear. Uh huh. And then the closer Anthem. Anthem. That's it. Which okay. then went into Anthem Part 2. That's right. On Take Off Your Pants and Jacket. Sure. Um, yeah. From that album, I would say Mutt and Going Away to College to me are the two big winners because Mutt, obviously, from American Pie. And I listen to going away to college when I was going away to college. I'm very, very, very <laughs> yeah. And so enema of the state was a big one. And then I, I told you, I trended a little bit later on in the scene. Right. Um, from under the cork tree fallout boy. I yeah. It was a very pretty good. big one. That was yeah. a big, that was a big transition album from yeah. them as sort of pop punk scene to just arena rock type band with like dance, dance and sugar. We're going down. Yep. Right in that um, emo pop fusion area. And you've been talking up. You really love bleed American as well. Right. Love Bleed American, sure. Okay. I, I I skew a little clarity, but I think that twofer is great. Bleed American or clarity, Bill? I mean, I, I would say clarity, okay. which is, I think, a, a, a generally sort of like inner circle Hall of Fame album mm -hmm. for me. And it's funny because I 
I was very late on Jimmy Eat World. Like I should have listened to Jimmy Eat World in 2002 and I didn't for a couple of years. Like I knew the big hits, but I didn't listen to Clarity until 2004 or five or so. Wow. Um, and one of the reasons why is because I went to go download, uh, I went to go download the first Jimmy Eat World album, which is Static Prevails. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for it on, on the Direct Connect network that I just mentioned. And somehow I downloaded a static lullaby instead. Mm, very different. Very, <laughs> very, very different. Like, right yeah. like a, a post hardcore kind of like a Treyu, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm not into. And I downloaded that and I'm like, well, I don't, why did I want to listen to this? This sucks. I'm not into this at all. And like years passed before I was like, oh, that's what I meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, Clarity is, is nearer and dearer to my heart. But I will say, last year, and I wrote about this uh, for on the website Medium, I lost a bunch of weight last year. Mm -hmm. And I listened to music while I was doing it. And Bleed American, the title track on Bleed American, uh, I listened to that over and over again doing cardio to the point where I cannot listen to it anymore without thinking of being on elliptical. <laughs> so uh, it helped, helped in unexpected ways, I would say. I, I okay. found that that album has aged incredibly well. Really well written album, really well produced. But I, I think Clarity has also aged extremely well. Clarity has, and this is not usual for a lot of these bands within this sort of world. Clarity has like a very definitive tone to it. Yes. Where even though the songs vary and the speed of the songs vary and the volume of the songs vary, it feels like, and this is where I think you're missing some things, Ty, by sort of being more single focused, and there's nothing wrong with that is that an album like Clarity all runs together extremely yeah. well, where the songs are actually better with the one before and the one that comes after. Well, so. and they tell a story, right? You don't sure. get that story if you're just downloading and listening to songs loose leaf. Oh, can I get into an album that I think is... Uh, you mentioned that Clarity aged well. Can I get into an album that I don't think aged well? Ooh, please. So you mentioned... Uh, you mentioned Weezer mm -hmm. earlier before. And the Green Album, I remember wanting to like the Green Album <laughs> yeah. more than anything ever before or since. And I mm -hmm. tried to convince myself that it was good. Did not enjoy it. But I would say Pinkerton, I don't think has wow. aged quite as well as I would have expected. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> like, the, like the lyrics on Pinkerton are not great. It's yes, it is creepy. And I think that's why the green album is what it is, where there was some weird, everybody sort of realized for the first time. And maybe this coincides with the fact that there were message boards about music all of a sudden and people were having conversations and interpreting lyrics and everybody's like, Oh, where the green album is just fluff. It's just pop fluff. Whereas Pinkerton rivers is kind of a weirdo. <laughs> He's writing letters to underage girls in Japan, that kind of thing. And I, I still like Pinkerton a lot, but there are certain songs that I was like, oh, this is somebody who is has a very strange worldview and yes. has holds a, a a really weird notion of romance. And it's still sonically really interesting to me and much more interesting than a lot of albums that came after it. But yeah, I think when you actually sit down and listen to what he's saying, it becomes a lot weirder than you remember. Troublesome is the word. Troublesome <laughs> is, is a fair word. So here's the album that I think that I would agree with how Ty described Bleed American as sort of breaking through and becoming more mainstream. I would argue the act that did it even more so. That's Dashboard Confessional. Ooh. So they, of course, they eventually, he, Chris Caraba, has a MTV Unplugged performance and he of the, the famed Everybody Sings Along in the Club kind of performances. Um, but I think that's what brought it to the mall after, I mean, Blink did, but in this era, it became this specific scene because by this time, Blink is playing arenas and they're just a rock band. They're not pop punk or anything like that in the early 2000s. They're just a famous rock band. They're on TRL. They're on the MTV Movie Awards, whatever. Mm -hmm. Dashboard feels like the band that was like we are just going to pour it all out there and it's cool for us to be very in touch with our feelings. And this is everything that I am thinking about this relationship in a quasi poetic way. And I was, <laughs> I was way into it and still kind of am for what it is. I can sort of put it in its own little box, but how do you guys fall on the dashboard question? Um, I mean, you know, I just went and saw a dashboard yeah, yeah, went, show. So tell me more about this concert you guys went to. What was okay, that? Did Dan cry? No. I, uh, I mean, uh, I cried a little bit. <laughs> First, tell me how you feel or how you felt about dashboard at the time and how that feeling has evolved. Okay. So I think the, the thing for me is that 
you know, when I got to Boston, started going and seeing shows with friends and mm. listening to emo bands in Boston, it was weird because like bands that were almost identical in terms of style, people didn't listen to them. Like I had friends who loved the Get Up Kids with all of their heart, who never listened to the Promise Ring or Braid or listened to them mm. once and were like, eh, not for me. Where it's like, no, like those bands go together. They're on the same you know, they should be going in the same thing. People who listened to Taking Back Sunday had never heard brand new. I had to argue with them about like to get them to listen to brand new. It was very odd. Um, Dashboard was like that, but even more intense than in that. I had tons of friends, well, not tons, but I had a few friends who were, uh, you know, who had no interest in emo whatsoever, but liked Dashboard. And right. it was sort of like this, you know, this entry point for people who had no interest in going any further. Um, I never, it never really stuck with me. Like I dated people who liked them. And I would, you know, like it because they liked it. But I never, like, I was never, I very rarely then or even now do I sit there and think, man, I really want to listen to Hands Down right now. It just never comes to me. <laughs> Ty, dashboard? I can say with utter certainty that I've been married, what now? About a year and a half, Dan? Uh-huh. Ish. <laughs> On Congratulations. At, thank you. On at least five separate occasions, the solid wife has thrown some old dashboard song on the Sonos and we've rocked out to it. I okay. I think it ages incredibly well. Just musically speaking, the stuff that they were putting out there was so far and away better than some of their other peers in the same genre that not only did it stick out during the time, but it also sticks out now. I can go back and listen to it and it doesn't feel to me like it's aged a whole lot. I was listening to Jimmy World when you mm-hmm. rang me up, Dan. Same right. deal. Brand new. Same deal. These bands that really had it in the musical department and what they could do instrumentally within some of the songs of this era. Those to me are the ones that, that really truly hold up. So dashboard falls in there. And I think it's interesting also from the standpoint of granted, it might be considered emo, but they were just really talented, right? They could play pretty much anything in any style that they wanted to. This was their chosen style. And I think it offered a really easy entry point into this larger emo thing because it didn't necessarily feel like some of the other stuff at the time, if that makes Where, sense. I will disagree because I can play some brand new songs on the guitar, which makes me think that it's not super musically advanced. <laughs> but listen, to, um, listen to some of the stuff that they oh, do. Oh yeah, for oh, sure. No, not all of it, but some. They're of it. very talented. Absolutely. Yes, no, that, um, Ty, important follow up. Uh, acoustic or full band for Dashboard? I'm a fan of acoustic. Same. I'm a fan it's of the acoustic. Here. Yeah. Uh, full band or acoustic, Bill? I, I think acoustic. I'm not. Again, not my Again, favorite not band either fan, way, yeah. but I think, you know, shoot your shot, right? Like, mm-hmm. like what makes them stand out is that the, you know, everyone thinks of Dashboard as the acoustic band, not the full band. It's fine, full, but mm-hmm. I always think of the acoustic versions of those songs. Ty, and this, I'll broach this to both of you because yes. Taking Back Sunday opened for Dashboard at the show, which by the way, was overall very good. Yeah, um, very enjoyable. Yeah. Brand new or Taking Back Sunday? Brand new. Oh. Bill? This is a very tough question. It's it's loaded. It's you know they're they're both still around. They're both touring. Uh, okay, let me answer. It. Quote unquote. They sure yeah. did. Let me answer it this way. Okay. Um, at in in, in their pump, mm-hmm. I liked I I liked Taking Back Sunday more than I ever liked Brand New. Okay. But I think for a long time now I have preferred Brand New to Taking Back Sunday. Um, so I was at. There was a taking back. I, I saw taking back something in brand new growing up in, in, in Long Island, and then mm-hmm. it, you know, kind of going to New York City and going to shows. Saw them many times uh, back in the day, and there was one sort of famous uh, taking back Sunday brand new show that was written up in my former Grantland colleague Andy Greenwald's book, uh, "Nothing Feels Good," and that was a like show at the Knitting Factory, which is a was a venue in Manhattan at the time. It's now a venue in Brooklyn. Uh, very, very hot show. I remember like people were just sweating and not, not passing out, but it was just like the hot, like the hottest show I've ever been to in my life. And, uh, you know, take Max Sunday went on before brand new. And I think they went on, yeah, I think they went on before brand new. And, you know, they were, it was, it was like, like peak Adam was there just jumping around, not singing, swinging his microphone, just being a lunatic. Uh, I think the show actually inspired the brand new mics are for singing, not, not for swinging. swinging show, yeah. Uh, which was part of the feud. But um, <laughs> it, 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 like, like they were, they were a more. That's a dynamic, shirt you can buy, Ty. Yeah, I know. I'm aware. Sure. I forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, like they were such a, they were a more dynamic live experience because they were so sort of melodramatic that yeah. that was what I enjoyed about them more. But I think the brand new songs 
uh, hold up a little better. I, I think that, like like the like like the the best Taking Back Sunday songs are so cathartic and so entertaining that I think mm-hmm. they're the most enjoyable. But I think the brand new catalog is a lot more even and a lot a lot fuller of better songs and songs that show signs of growth than perhaps the Taking Back Sunday catalog. Yeah, I think of Taking Back Sunday at this point. They're much more of a moment band. Yes. Like their songs have moments in them that are arguably mu- like those moments. There are more of them. There, it's a deeper roster of moments than Brand New has in their songs, where you just get very excited that a particular part of a song is coming up and about yes. to hit. Mm-hmm. And I, that's huge. That's a near impossible feat musically to do. Just that's what everybody looks for. That hooky moment. Yes, brand new. I you know I like your favorite weapon b- more than Tell All Your Friends. I like Dejan Tendu more than what Taking Back Sunday has released since Tell All Your Friends, and even Devil and God are raging inside of me more. But um, brand new had that one album to me that I could listen to your favorite weapon front to back a thousand times. Whereas Tell All Your Friends, I had to be in the mood. I had to be in that headspace to listen to. And yes, there there w- there were those cathartic moments. But I think brand new tips the scales just a little bit for me, Ty. What do you think? I, I'm brand oh. new. You know, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm on the brand new train. One one thing I was going to add a little bit about, I believe it's Taking Back Sunday. And for some reason, mm-hmm. don't shoot me. I always get them mixed up with Saves the Day. Oh, <sighs> oh God. Rough. They're from New Jersey. Oh. That's so different. Oh, stake through the heart. I apologize. I The first, well, I guess it would be the second and third and yeah, second and third saves the day albums through being cool and stay what you are. I feel like are absolute masterpieces. Mm-hmm. I, I would say, especially through being cool, yeah. is like quintessential drive around in the suburbs with your friends yes. and sing an album start to finish. Yes. And I think to me, there are yeah six or seven tracks that when I was looking to figure out my dream EP that would describe my emo brain, there are six to seven tracks that I could, you know, whether it's you vandal, whether it's even all star me, whether it's Holly Hawks, forgets me, forget me nots, the, the title track through being cool with that great drum and bass intro, whatever. There are so many on there that it really is still evocative of everything I was doing around that time. So where do you stand now with saves the day bill? I mean, though, it's still those two albums for me. You know, I went and saw the acoustic uh, singer songwriter show where it was a bunch of emo singer mm. song artists and uh, one of them it was with uh, SB Nation Spat offered of yep. course and one of the singers was Chris Conley from Saves the Day uh, not the former Georgia Whiteout <laughs> right. but the uh, maybe stoner guy from New Jersey and it was great and those songs even acoustically even in 2016 are still incredibly fun to sing and mm. You know, I, I, later says the day. I'm not going to admit. You know, listen to it once or twice was not really my cup of tea. Maybe it was the wrong moment. Maybe it just wasn't. I wasn't at that point in my life where it, it fit. But uh, th- those two albums, especially uh, for me, especially through being cool, are just. I mean, it, it, it's like a sugar rush, like, like the yeah. perfect sugar rush. Just incredibly, uh, incredibly fitful for that moment. Ty, not to go back, but Bill mentioned Piebald. Did you ever listen to Piebald? Not really. No. I, I was familiar. Like, I was familiar. They, it, they, there's never anything that stuck for me. They tow an interesting line between sort of emo, definitely like faster rock, not fast, but like more rock and roll. And also they're a little bit wacky. Oh yeah. Where they're just a really fun band and you should go back and listen to pie ball. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, when, when I said, when I said they opened up for Kaiju big battle, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, they were all in Halloween costumes you know, playing a full set. Uh, they were, they, they're not, like, full, they're not full on like aquabats. To no, clear the music. no, they're not. They're not like Adam and his package. They're not, they're not, right. they're not like, not, not say Adam and his package is bad. Adam and his package is great, but he, you, you wouldn't think of them as like a gimmicky sort of band. They just were just kind of goofy, which is great. I think that's, that's an underrated quality in a genre that, especially as sort of a transition from second wave emo to third wave emo, became very sort of self-serious and very melodramatic. Like it was kind of funny that they were goofs, uh, but we, like they were emblematic of a kind of band where they started pretty much as a, uh, like a hardcore band, like not like super, super, duper hardcore, but like so similar to saves today in that these bands started as hardcore bands and kind of slowed things down and became more melodic. And then eventually just turned into like kind of just straight up rock bands, like really mm-hmm. lost a lot of the emo tinge to it. 
and it was just interesting to see that kind of transition with with bands like that. In that, uh, you know, I feel like I liked them in that moment, but then as they became less emo or as they were more hardcore, it didn't really do it for me. Yeah, or Time. or as you grew up, let me pivot yeah. a little bit. This show is a little bit timely because Blink One Eighty Two just released a new album. Yeah, California. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> have any have any of you guys tried to listen to it? I listened to it through once, and I. Uh, no. it's, I, I, it's very okay. Mm-hmm. I have not listened to it, but I've read like a dozen reviews of it for some reason. Um, it is. I mean, he's what Mark Hopp is is what like forty five, forty six. Like I know, it's very hard to sort of replicate the sound that Blink is known for, but singing about old things. You can't be immature at forty six. Like Blink was so good at being when they were twenty seven. It's it's a very strange listen. I felt very and, awkward when I saw it on Spotify trying yeah. to listen through. And there are a couple there are a couple tracks that harken back to the quintessential blink in some capacity. It's not the same. It's never gonna be the same, right? But yeah. There are there are a few tracks on there that remind me of what was. Ultimately, I can't get past the feeling that I'm in my mid thirties and blink is still putting out new albums and there's still a, a fair amount of immaturity mm-hmm. on those albums that I've, um, well, come, it's with the alkaline trio guy. It's, well, with, it's with the alkaline yeah. trio. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's just not doing it for me the way it did when I was, you know, 24 years old. When mm-hmm. I, I think that's why sort of the emo pop punk reunions have been sort of more successful than any actual releases by bands that stayed together or new releases, because those are sort of like you're reliving a past moment. You're not expecting it to be like, even if your feelings are not the same as they were when you were 22 or 23 or when you were that age and listening to that music in real time, you know, you're still sort of like, you can feel yourself going back to those moments. Whereas with this, like that's like, you're expecting to have a new memory of them in your thirties. And that just doesn't seem to die. I think it's what Bill brings up though is interesting because trying to figure out why suddenly now and not like 2009 or 2011 that bands are finding success touring. And, you know, I went and saw say anything and saves the day, both play their huge albums They played through being cool and is a real boy in their entireties, then played more songs. I was trying to figure out why 2016 is when this has all hit because all of these albums these songs came out 10 12 15 years ago and my theory is it's the sort of spotifyization of everything because we've all purchased a ton of albums or singles or whatever but through you know you lose your ipod you're migrating things on hard drives and something corrupts or whatever you just lose your music collection one way or the other you move somewhere you don't bring your cds that'd be ridiculous in 2016 but i feel like spotify allows you to access anything you want, the whole streaming notion, so you can suddenly say, yes, I'm going to listen to Slow Gherkin, or I'm going to listen to MXPX, or I'm going to listen to Yellow Card, whatever, and because it's at my fingertips. And then suddenly you see Yellow Card is touring for $16. You can go see Yellow Card. Yeah. Why the hell not? That's- I have a, I have a question. Please. Has this been a Spotify ad the entire time and I yes. didn't realize it? It has been a spot. You, I, I, it's a spawn con for Spotify or, Spotify <laughs> or RDIO, whatever, um, or Apple Music or any of these services that allow you to access all of these old libraries that you perhaps like. I just clicked on a God. What's the, now I'm forgetting the band. Like I clicked on like a catch 22 song or clicked oh, on like boy. a bad caddy song. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to listen to the full album, but I'm going to enjoy the hell out of those two and a half minutes. I yeah. couldn't before. Mm-hmm. That's fair. And I, I think it's, you know, the time frame has lapsed long enough where, oh. you know, like you, you can develop nostalgia for something a decade later. You couldn't really develop nostalgia for something in like 2008. Like I saw the Get Up Kids around then mm-hmm. and I was really bad. Like it was not a fun experience. I felt like they didn't want to be there. Right. Um, I think I saw Ozma maybe around the same time. Mm-hmm. And the same thing. It's just like it didn't feel fun. Like, like no one was really enjoying themselves. It might have been earlier. It might have been later. But it was like it was too early for it to be nostalgic. But when I saw Matt Pryor at that acoustic singer songwriter show a few months ago, it was great. Like I was really into all the songs. I went back and listened to the get up kids and really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to see the get up kids now, but it's just a certain amount of time has to pass to make it sort of feel comfortable. So what was Ty for you, the tipping point where you were like, I'm way into this kind of music, but man, there's just something now where I need to graduate to something else. Yeah. 
<laughs> you mean like when I started working full time? Yeah, that that'll happen. But like, so for me, for example, like when a lot of these bands, when they went real deep into like the violent imagery, poetry kind of thing, like yeah, your Hawthorne yeah. Heights, your when they became the, the swoopy haircut <laughs> sort of did me in. And maybe it's because I'll never be able to grow my hair in a swoopy way. But when it became about that sort of image, and this isn't to sound like the most hipster thing ever because it was always about image for a lot of these bands, but like it just felt like it, it became self parody at a certain point. And that's when like, I'm going to listen to the postal service a little bit more. I'm going to listen to the shins a little bit more. And I just sort of started veering in that direction. Yeah. I, I think that's sort of, to me, that kind of stuff, like Cawthorn Hyatt's a trade, that sort of thing. That's, that's really third wave emo. That's where I kind of right. like, I got out of it. And to be honest, I think the like the the band that transitioned from second wave emo to third wave emo, the band that kind of like moved that along, was Taking Back Sunday. Yeah, I feel like they're the actual sort of natural bridge between those two sort of genres. Like they were very melodramatic and had a very distinct image. Especially Adam had a very distinct yes. image. And you know, I I don't not really into a lot of those post till your friends albums or songs really i think the next album a couple songs i'm into but really after that i'm i'm really out like i'm just not into it at all um i i think a lot of you know a lot of bands in that image and the bands that came from that image and on and on and on uh really you know i was out at that point but yeah. i i think that happened around no three maybe oh, was three right four. yeah yeah and I, it, it sucks because there have been sonically interesting bands that play that kind of music that you're just like, I don't know if I want to go down this road again. I've, my heart has been broken by you, Atreyu. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if I, if I have the patience and energy. And I've, I've found myself liking a couple of bands. Like Cartel came along a little bit yeah, later than yeah. that. I really like Cartel. Like they sound cool. Um, but, you know, those bands, like I couldn't name an all time low song for See, you. See, and it, I, this is where I was going to go with this. I'm glad yeah. you brought them up because I don't know if I have a moment in my life where. I decided, okay, it's time to graduate. But mm -hmm. I do remember the moment when I heard nothing personal, which is like, oh, what is that? Nine. That was all time lows. Oh, okay. You know, probably their best album. Okay. And it was at that point that I, I sort of proclaimed that the genre was dead. You lasted a long time. Yeah. I lasted a long time. Yeah. You're okay. not going to confuse me with having worldly musical tastes. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, Nothing personal for me is where it all kind of stopped. And I knew it listening to it. It was a good album, but pretty much everything that came after it was decidedly very different. And at that point, there were so many bands who were still trying to kind of tap into that sound. But that's when we start talking about the bands who really, to me, felt like the boy bands with, with distortion and guitars. So for me, that was, that was the breaking point where I knew it was over, not necessarily the point where I felt like I needed to graduate. Right. Is there a band, Bill, and I'm putting you both on the spot here, that you were shocked wasn't a lot better, bigger? Saves the day, I think. Yeah. I think it's like when, if you had told me in 2002 or like early 2003 that the, of the bands I listened to, Modest Mouse and Death Cab for oh. Cutie were going, to be, <laughs> were, were going to be like the most successful bands or yeah. have the biggest hits, I would have been shocked. Like I, I remember, like I couldn't get people to listen to Death Cab for Cutie for trying like <laughs> I couldn't get people to like to download stuff when it took 10 seconds to download an album refused to it took Seth Cohen it took Seth Cohen I don't have Seth Cohen's powers to yeah. be fair I mean like I remember people like I, my college roommate who was a huge bro would like get angry at me for listening to old modest styles like this isn't even English what are you listening to <laughs> like foot on came out like six months later and it was a huge hit just un it was like totally unfathomable to me but saves the day mm -hmm. I mean before uh, after those two albums they should have been an enormous band. And I, it still shocks me that they didn't have, you know, three or four massive hit singles, if not hit records. Ty, do you have a band like that, that you're just like, man, how does this band not hit like they should be hitting? <sighs> yeah. I mean, it's probably not a proper answer to say newfound glory because new they, I mean, they, they, they hit, they hit. Yeah. I just felt like they should have hit more. Oh, okay. You know, like they were quintessential, to this era of music. Mm -hmm. And I feel mm -hmm. like if you were into the music, you were into newfound glory. You knew NFG pretty well. Very polarizing band because of Jordan's voice. But there were a lot of people who still didn't know a damn thing about newfound glory. And that always yeah. surprised me. This, yeah, they were like two, 
2000, I want to say, was when like My Friends Over You. Yeah. That sounds yeah. about the right time. Sure. But yeah, I mean, I know that was on, it was on rock radio and they were on TRL a little bit, but that's fair. Um, to me, so it was a band called Midtown, yep. which oh, yeah. sure. became Cobra Starship. Like the, the Gabe from Midtown started Cobra Starship and they sort of hit a little bit. I really thought Midtown was going to be bigger. Um, I got a little bit into like the sub sub genre that was like desert emo type like twangy alt country and that sort of thing and like the format if you remember um the singer of the format eventually became huge and now he's the lead singer of fun but the format was great really me. yeah i had no idea that was true that was that nate nate Roos. Roos? yeah so he's the lead singer of fun so he's gotten famous i suppose um there's a there's a small band that i just figured they were gonna i don't know if they were gonna be a big band but i thought they were gonna be bigger and that's limbeck i don't know if you guys ever listened to limbeck is that your your uh, abbreviation for Limp Bizkit? It is not. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> Limbeck is sort of an alt country band from Orange County, but they were in this sort of the scene as well. Um, but I, yeah, I really figured the format was going to be bigger. Um, and there were a couple of bands that like I followed from their infancy. Like I had interviewed All American Rejects before their first, and it was just like the two of them in a drum machine at first, and oh, wow. they blew up. So that was kind of cool to see. Um, but in terms of bands that I thought were going to be bigger, I knew brand new was never going to hit. They were just too weird and too, uh, out there, not weird and out there, but they were too just sort of intense. I would, I would say to like make that breakthrough onto TRL, but too destructive, maybe. Yeah. yeah a little too destructive. Um, really good though. So good. Uh, I, I didn't know if they were going to hit, but I really for a, a time couldn't stop listening to say anything. Mm -hmm. I really thought they were going to do something bigger than they did. And maybe there's time. I think he's doing a, an album with Chris Conley, Max Bemis from say anything. Yes. They have a project together. So who knows? Um, but I think the, Oh, and there's one more, excuse me. This band feuded with fallout boy. That's how long ago it was in the oh, Chicago yeah. pop punk scene. Do you have a guess bill? Feuded with fallout boy in the Chicago pop punk scene. Yeah. Would, this is this post alkaline trio. This is not, this is uh, 2002 ish, 2002, 2003, somewhere in there. I think I know mm. the answer to this. And they the played together, they toured together. And like, then, then they, they were like a mini version of Taking Back Sunday and brand new writing songs about each other. Really? Um, I don't remember. Is it, I'm going to say, let me throw out Branson, but I don't think that's it. it. Is, it's not Branson. It's a band called Spittlefield. Okay, I don't, I don't remember. Who had a song oh. called. Um, I love the way she said LA and I really thought Spittlefield was going to break through. I do you think fallout boy held them down. I wouldn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. Those guys seem ruthless with their Rushmore song titles. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, those first two fallout boy albums were, I, I thought fantastic within the context of uh, the pop punk scene. So let's get to our, our rankings. How about that? Sure. Oh boy. Yeah, let's do it. So I asked each of you, part to come up with basically a track listing. I wanted 10 or fewer songs, but listen, I'm flexible. There's no, <laughs> there's no audio limits on a podcast. Um, so we'll start with our guest, Bill. Yes. Um, and if you name a track or name a song, or excuse me, name a track or name a band that one of us has on our respective EPs, we'll, we'll respond. So please start wherever you'd like. Yeah, I wonder if we have a... Uh, we probably have at least one song. It's at least on two of ours. Okay. Is, is my guess. So I, I went alphabetically. I uh, went through just my head and I went through my record collection. It was very tough. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have nine. Uh, okay. Mostly, mostly emo. Uh, so I have The Anniversary uh, without Panassos, which I think is just very sort of like... What's the right word? Syrupy sort of emo, mm -hmm. I guess. Like very keyboard intensive, just a really fun sort of band to jump around to. Uh, Appleseed Cast, Forever Longing the Golden Sunsets, I think a wow. super, super, super underrated band. Uh, okay. A different style of emo, not really poppy, more sort of math rocky and mm -hmm. proggy to some extent. Uh, Braid, Forever Got Shorter, which is on the Postmark Stamps compilation, which was a compilation of like nine actual postmarked records. These are is, deep cuts, Ty. These are the most, very deep cuts. This, yeah. this, this is the most, it, it's the most emo thing. I yeah. Think. <laughs> no, uh, you've, but, you've done well with the assignment. But that, but that was a, that was a braid get up kids split. Yeah. Uh, which is really, really good. And I have a get up kids song as well. I spent a long time trying to pick the right get up kids song. I have one on here as well. Yeah. I had holiday for a while. Mm -hmm. 
But I ended up with um, the electric version of Newfound Mass. Interesting. Early. Uh, yeah, I really like... I mean, I, I was in Massachusetts. I remember there yeah. was one time where literally I was the only one among my friends who had an iPod. They all had, you know, still had this one. And they bullied me on a road trip for hours into playing Mass Pike on the Massachusetts Turnpike until mm-hmm. I agreed to play it. There were um, multiple Massachusetts options that you could have chosen from. I know, but they were very insistent about Mass Pike. Uh, Jimmy Eat World, again, very tough to choose. Mm-hmm. I eventually went with Just Watch the Fireworks, which is just, Ooh. I think, quintessential sort of epic Jimmy Eat World song. Mm-hmm. Uh, really love it. Uh, Promise Ring, Why Did We Ever Meet? Mm-hmm. Kind of was really not into in 2001, 2002. Like, really, really got into later on, but just like super fun band. I think like the quintessential, like really good, if not peaking as much as the Get Up Can Speak demo band. Uh, saves the day. I really wanted to say just the first three songs off through being cool. I said oh. you vandal. Okay. Uh, I, I feel like could have gone for the single, but you vandal is, I think a little bit better of a song. Uh, and then I'm going to go with eight. I'll go with Texas is the reason. Wow. Uh, I will go with again, tough picking between songs. I go with, if it's here, when we get back, it's ours, which is off an EP. Um, just really rollicking sort of two and a half minute, just, super fun song. So I think a good mix of like kind of ang- not really too much angry emo, like like not much, a lot of brand new on my list, but a lot of sort of fun emo, mm-hmm. a lot of energetic stuff and sort of veering a little bit towards pop punk, but more emo for me. Yeah. A lot of thoughtful tracks on there. I would I'm say. a very thoughtful guy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I have some crossover. Ty, do you have immediate crossover? I have absolutely no crossover. Really? Nice. I like no it. Crossover no crossover whatsoever. World, no get up kids. I have some Jimmy Eat world. Okay, so what I meant crossover band wise. So crossover who, band wise, yeah. What's your Jimmy World track? So I took a different approach to the assignment. Okay, okay. As you described, um, and this is, I think, a, a, a sort of an homage to the way I experienced this music. But I'm not going deep cuts. Instead, my thought process was, if I were to look at my most played list uh-huh. from this That's genre, fine. it's a lot of hits. It's a lot of stuff that people know. But it's more in the vein of what would I have played the most? If I were picking 10 songs, what would my top 10 have looked like? Okay. Totally valid. Walk so that, me through it. So that's what I put together. Um, all right. So I've got, I've got some multiple bands on here. But uh, the big one for me, the two big ones for me, were always Sugar We're Going Down by Fall Out Boy. Okay. And Ocean Avenue by Yellow Card. Okay. I could have listened to those songs a million times combined if I actually had the stats on it. But those two for me were ones that bubbled to the top. I also have another. Do you go ahead? Sorry. Do you have a, do you have a preference between the two? Probably sugar. We're going down. Really big FOB guy here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, those two songs, I mean, there were, there were two or three songs on from under the cork tree and, and two or three songs from ocean Avenue that, those songwriters. I mean, I think it Pete Wentz wrote the songs. I don't know if Ryan Key wrote the songs for Yellow Card, but that's it's an incredible skill to be able to write a good pop song. And they did. Absolutely. So Fallout Boys also on here. I also have Grand Theft Autumn. Good song. Is, Where's your boy a, tonight? Yeah, yeah. A cut off an older album. Um, I've got some blink on here, right? I've got Going okay. Away to College, which you mentioned before. One mm-hmm. of the best tracks. I've also got Damn It, which we didn't mention from a different album. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fat Lip was a quintessential song from like the sure. American Pie era, right? Saw Sum 41 and Yellow Card together at the Ventura Theater. I've got Sweetness by Jimmy Eat World, uh-huh. which is my favorite Jimmy Eat World song. And then I then I sort of go back to uh, Green Day, When I Come Around. Big oh, fan of When okay. I Come Around, Green Day. And the final two on my EP track, most played type of thing is a Dirty Little Secret, All American Rejects. Mm-hmm. And then my favorite dashboard song from the old Spider-Man soundtrack, Vindicated. Ooh, sure. So I, I'm trying to think of my connection to any of those. Um, I, I, I can say I have one sort of interesting crossover in that Braid did a song called Grand Theft Autumn long before mm-hmm. Fallout. Yeah. And okay. according, according to Matt Pryor of the Get Up Kids, uh, Fallout Boy heard the song and then just stole the title without getting permission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. So to now I'm thinking Fallout Boy maybe did try to bury Spittlefield. <laughs> that might be the case. They seem like they might have a ruthless bone or two in their collective bodies. <laughs> it's um, not a scene, Dan. It's an arms race. It's That's so, true. Um, I interned 
Was I an intern then? Yes. I interned for Prospect Pictures, which was co-owned by Marco Siega, who at that time directed the Dirty Little Secret video for the All-American Rejects. Really? Indeed. Um, okay. My list is as follows. So we haven't mentioned Alkaline Trio at all. I happen to like Alkaline Trio. I just sort of tailed off when they went even heavier than usual with the, the blood. And it happens. Everybody steers a little bit too far <laughs> into things sometimes. Yeah. So I have the first track off of God Damn It, which is cringe. But I like the whole the whole God Damn It album is great to me. Um, that was 2099, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to stay vagrant. And I have this was off of a comp. Saves the day. Sell my old clothes. I'm off to heaven. Yeah. Cla- I, I think maybe the maybe the second or third best Saves the Day song for me. Okay. It's but phenomenal song. It's a great track. And even the other song they did on that comp, a dragon D flat is great on the, another year on the streets album or comp um, really, really good song. They closed out their New York show with sell my old clothes. I'm off to heaven. Um, I'm throwing dashboard on there because I just listened to too much dashboard, not to include it. I'm going <laughs> with the places you have come to fear the most, which good tune. also is just like kind of a pretentious title. And I just, I like that he steered into the pretension with the second album. It's great. Mm-hmm. Um, I have Motion City Soundtracks, my favorite accident, mm-hmm. which has held up and they played it recently. When we uh, saw, they were also on that show before breaking up. Yes, this is true. Um, I have a Jimmy Eat World track from Clarity. And to me, this was the the quintessential breakup song from that album. And that is for me, This is Heaven. Good oh, I thought you were going to say Goodbye Sky Harbor. Ooh, also would have been good. I guess there are a number of breakup songs on Clarity. <laughs> um <laughs> I have cute without the E parenthetically cut from the team because mm-hmm. that that falls into the tie corollary of like how I listened to this song 5,000 times. How can I not include it? Very fair. Um, I have a song called uh, in Ohio on some steps by Limbeck, which is their acoustic track on that album. And it's a really good road album. Um, I have 70 times seven as my brand new track. This was impossible to uh, to move across all of their tracks and tracks that I like, but I talked about taking back Sunday and the moments that I like in songs and that, that bass bridge is just brutal. You don't seven. I, I 70 times seven is very cathartic. Mm -hmm. I like, I like Jude law a little more. It's a great song. And I think they hate it. I think brand new hates that song. 70 times seven. No, uh, Jude law and a broad. Um, I mean, I can say, I think they hate that album to some extent. I think that's true, but there are, if I were to go across brand new tracks that I was selecting between, it would be 70 times seven. Soco Amaretta lime, probably mixtape. Okay. I believe you, but my Tommy gun doesn't. Um, and also uh, sick transit. Glory is great. I'd say the shower scene too. Super shower scene's excited. great. Um, I'm a big fan of the boy who blocked his own shot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Deja Tendu is a really good album. Really good. Um, I have a Get Up Kids track on here. So I have 10 total. So I'm almost done. I have, and this was very tough for me too, because even Songs to Write Home About is great. And yeah. even there are like three tracks on, on a wire that are legitimately very good to me. There are nine, nine tracks that are not that great though. There are, that's the thing. <laughs> um, so I like Overdue and I like Campfire Kansas. Yep. But good. I went with a track off of Something to Write Home About just because I love the beginning of the song so much. I love I'm a Loner, Daddy a Rebel. Mm-hmm. So I'm there. Are, there are like also four or five versions of that song. Yes, too. there are. Um, I went with the format, the first single. Oh wait, oh can I talk about that? The opening to Please. that. Score? Yeah. Um, it's like the drum part, right? Mm-hmm. It's very similar to the drum part from, I believe, uh, "Little Miss Can't Be Wrong" by the Spin Doctors. Whoa, that does <laughs> sound. Okay, hold on. I pictured it in my head. Yes. Or or it uh, a, or is it, it might might be two princes, but a spin doctor song has a very similar drum opening, which I always think of. But I do like the opening a lot. Yes. Um. Yeah. Come tomorrow, I'll be I'll be on my way back home. Mm-hmm. Um. I think that's my list. If I had to choose, I mean, I I left off Hurricane by something corporate. I just these are all like songs that just hit at the exact right time of my life, but. In terms of songs that I played more than any other song, and in terms of the song even on this listing, 70 times 7 to me, it's just that mix of catharsis and intensity and moments that that to me is the track. It's funny because you're like you're a very nice, calm, chill human being. And that's yeah. not a nice, calm, chill song. No. And I had I had a lot of stress and heartbreak 
in 2001, 2002. So to me, that that was like that song hit at the perfect time. Well, and that was sort of imperative, right? In yeah. order to connect yeah. with this genre, Dan mentioned it on a show we did a couple of weeks ago. You needed transformational heartbreak or some kind mm-hmm. of transformational rejection during that phase of life to really attach you to this. There are a lot of friends who I had who maybe didn't have that kind of experience who had mm-hmm. no interest in this genre whatsoever. Maybe if they had the heartbreak, they would have. Right. Not enough people were getting dumped in 2001. That's what it's about, man. That's what I'm saying. That's the key. So what? So Bill talked about gravitating more towards the sort of indie rock and moving into that direction. Ty, did you once you hit your wall? Yeah. Be it in 08, 09, or whatever. Yeah. Did you go more towards radio? Did you go more matured, more thoughtful? Where did you go? Well, it's funny you should ask that. Yeah, Mr. Rubenstein. Um, I feel you know my musical prowess quite well. Mm-hmm. After eight years of podcasting, together. yeah. At, at the time we started podcasting in '08, I asked you to name a song that you currently liked. I don't. There's no way Bill knows this. <laughs> Do you know what he answered? I'm, af- I'm afraid it's, to it's say. a legendary moment in the show. Yeah, Ty I went. Know. I said, Ty, this is a this is a safe space. Yep. Just give me a song that's sort of on the radio right now, that's popular right now, that you like. Turns out, wasn't that safe a space because the joke is still made. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> Um, he said trains soul system. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. See, oh, I'm man. good on my feet, Bill, but Dan <laughs> has this tendency to ask me questions that still somehow make me feel insecure about that. And so, <laughs> Hey, soul sister kind of was the first thing that came to mind. I went with it thinking, Oh, it's a hit. I've never <laughs> lived Ty, it down. Can I ask you a question? Please. Uh, do you still like Hey, soul sister? I'm still okay with Hazel Sister. That's fine. You know what? You know what? Steer into the ditch. If you it's like not, it. It's not going on the EP track. Right. Fair. All right. It's not even going on on the Spotify playlist. But if it comes on, yeah, there might be a few head bobs there. I'm not ashamed to admit that. Um, no, that's fine. To answer your question, though, Dan, mm-hmm. I have steered much more in the direction of traditional rock. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ario Speedwagon. Are you, mm-hmm. Sure. Ario Speedwagon. Sticks. You know, um, the Bastilles, the um, Imagine Dragons, that type of stuff. Okay. For me now is sort of more where it heads, but... Um, you didn't say Lumineers, so we're okay. I like Lumineers. I'm okay, okay. with Lumineers. Not as much as Solid Wife Kate, but I'm, I'm okay. okay with them. Um, Vance Joy, stuff like that. I'm, I can get into that. Okay. Otherwise, though, listening to a lot of Hits 1 on Sirius XM... And okay. that, I think, qualifies me to some degree as having the musical taste of like a 13-year-old girl. And I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm okay with that. I'm confident. Listen, in that. we did a deep dive on Dashboard, so it's not yeah. like we're above anything here. No, right. for sure. Bill, so what do you listen to now? What do you like listening to now? Oh, man. I'm so old. I listen to a lot of like old indie. Okay. Um, like I, I transitioned from sort of like the bands I mentioned who were sort of on the cusp, like people would describe Modest Mouse or the Summerprint Plan or mm-hmm. Death Cat as, as emo, but I don't really think they were, especially by the definition that we're going with here. Um, and then bands that were kind of like on the next sort of range of them, like your, your typical like Pavement, Yola mm-hmm. Tango, like, like 90s US indie bands. And then I just kind of stopped growing or listening to anything else. That's what really what I listen to at this point still. <laughs> uh, I just kind of stopped maturing as a human. But yeah, I mean, that's still pretty much what I listen to. Uh, recent stuff, like I like the, the Parfait Quartz album this year. Uh, I, I like, like stuff like that. Like I like going back and trying to find things that I missed in my in, in going through and listening to those bands at the time. What right. about you, Dem? You're, you're oh, such a wide variety of stuff. I feel So like. I am... <laughs> As both of you know, and most people that listen to the show know, I'm like a thousand years old. Yes. I am. I'm a very old man. And so the music that I started gravitating towards when I was just, I didn't want to keep up with bands anymore. So I just went way older. So I listen to like Sam Cooke. Yeah. I listen to like 60s soul. I love like, I'll listen to early Stevie Wonder stuff like that, where I just, I know what I'm getting every time. It's That's not going to challenge me a lot, but it's going to make me feel good. Like I love, listening to Otis Redding. Like everything he did to, to me is like incredible. So the the guy who released those postmark stamp comps I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. I think I think after he did that, he started a like a jazz 
out of like an out of print jazz label, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, like, th- that's not that's not that uncommon of a reaction or a transition. I feel like. Yeah, that sounds way. right. Um, there have been a couple of like, there have been a couple of musicians or bands recently that tend to approximate those more classic sounds. Like I like Mayor Hawthorne. I haven't listened They're to good. all of his albums. I saw Mayor Hawthorne. Yeah. Like that to me is totally fun. Good music to listen to walking around the city or whatever you're doing. I the like first, that kind of stuff. The first like Titus Andronicus album I mm-hmm. felt like was very sort of emo in a, in a good way. And then there's like the, like the whole quote unquote emo revival, you know, the, the hotelier, that kind of stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. which is all good. And I'm into that, but that's also like a different point in my life. Like I'm into right. it, but I don't think I can get as into it as I was. It's hard to do it halfway. Right. That's, that's what I've sort of learned when I try, you know, somebody will recommend you should listen to yeah. X band. They're a lot like brand new or whatever. I can't listen to three tracks and just move on with my day. I'm either like completely obsessed with a band or I just don't have the time. While we're talking about your musical taste, Dan, if people <laughs> want to subscribe to our newsletter, yeah, you can go to solidverbal.com or the Facebook page. There's a sign up button there. Once we start sending out our newsletter, one of the weekly features or bi-weekly, bi-weekly features that we've had on that is Dan's Spotify playlist. Yeah, I change up the mix each week. Yeah. And wow. I've actually gotten a lot out of that, to be yes. fair. I mean, given what you know of my musical taste, right. I've gotten a lot out of what you sent. So I've enjoyed that. If, if people are interested in more of the pulse of what you're into, that could be a good way for people to do it. I also have a musical personal question for you guys. Okay. Since sure. my read here is that you're both a little bit more plugged into what I would consider good music. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to be very self-effacing here and just say, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the person to comment on any of this stuff, but is it okay for me? Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying I'm into this, but just hypothetically speaking, I have a friend who <laughs> likes Coldplay. Are you allowed to like Coldplay? Because I think you're allowed, I think you're allowed to like whatever you want. Because can I, can I, the reason the reason I ask this question is because mm-hmm. I have seen it out on the social medias. Anyone who admits to liking Coldplay is right. subsequently lampooned. I mean. If I'm being honest, that first Coldplay album is fire. <laughs> no, 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 no. I will not like the Radiohead side of me that like listened to Travis and other Brit, like not like post post Brit poppy kind of bands. Love that first Coldplay album. Mm-hmm. Not super into the other ones, but like when they're on, they're pleasant enough. I'm not like I'm never like oh I have to go see Coldplay live or I have to go listen to this Coldplay album. Okay. Uh, post par- that's Parachutes is the first album, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. sure. Um, but like, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's not as if they're offensive. I think they're so much better than listening to perhaps the Lumineers or Mumford and Sons or something of that vein. So yeah, I, I think you're fine. Okay, I'm just because yeah. it, it elicits such a strong reaction from people out there, and it's maybe they're just not the Nickelback. Way. No, they're not Nickelback. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's something about Chris Martin. I mean, they're they're a, a softer band for better yes. or worse, and the lead singer married Gwyneth Paltrow, who's not like the most beloved person. So there is that celebrity air about them that I think right. can rub people the wrong way. But and sixty million people listen to every single track of theirs on Spotify. There's yeah. a reason yeah. why. There's yeah. talent. There's interesting music there. It's not for everybody, but they're fine. Okay, I, I think there's a very obvious sort of attempt to sweep for epicness yes. in their songs. Like I think they want. Like I feel like every one of their songs or every one of their songs that I hear is like in danger of becoming the FIFA anthem for a World <laughs> Cup. <laughs> which which like that's fine. Like some of those songs are, are totally fine. Like you need that space. Right. Um and I think w- when people were comparing them in the past, very much earlier in their careers to Radiohead, like like when Radiohead was coming out with Kid A and it was very sort of difficult. The people were like, oh, why can't he be more like Coldplay and just do an album that sounds like the Benz? And I think Radiohead sort of ran from that idea of being, you know, this very sort of the biggest band in the world, which I don't know if they would have been or, or didn't try to be very big, but whatever. Like Coldplay really embraced that in a way that I don't think anyone did uh, okay. before U2 and I, or since U2. And I think that that, um, that can be a turnoff to some people. It's, okay. it's the idea of being a little calculated. Yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly. That you are like, what will sound good in an arena? What will sound mm-hmm. good in an opening ceremony? And that's almost reminds me of, and this has nothing to do with pop punk or emo, but like when Will Smith decided, 
let's see what the biggest movies have in common. And I'm only going to do those types of movies Alien movies. Yeah. And he discovered that like six of the top 15 movies ever have space or aliens in them. Yeah. And he was like, I'm just going to do that for a long time and become <laughs> the biggest actor in the world. And you're like, it's not a bad business. It's not a bad commerce direction, sure. but it feels hollow. Okay. And I think, I think that's where people stand sometimes with cold play. So let me do this to bring it back to full circle. Yeah. Our mm-hmm. topic at hand, um, Bill Barnwell, very kind to join us here from ESPN. What I was thinking maybe we could do to just sort of close this out is mm-hmm. go around the virtual table here and mm-hmm. each one of us give a pop punk slash emo hot take to leave our audience with. Does that sound Ooh. like it's something we can do? Oh boy. Um, uh, this is tough. Let me go first because I've been thinking about one. Okay. I mean, Bill's been shattering with shattering the show with hot takes. Weezer hasn't <laughs> held up. <laughs> Dashboard is for people you know, not for you. Well, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. The one for me, the one for me, Dan, uh-huh. and I said this to you on Gchat. Yeah. I think brand new compared to so many of the other bands that we've discussed, I think mm-hmm. brand new was musically superior to all the others. Okay. When you say musically, what do you mean? I mean, musically in terms of vocal talent, just what they did instrumentally, the depth of their lyrics, the total package really, I think made them far and away better than so many of the other bands here that we talked about. Okay. I have one. If you don't have one, please, I'm, I'm trying to search the banks. Okay. Um, I feel pretty strongly about this one. I don't know if it's too controversial, but I do feel genuinely that this is the case. Uh, all Alkaline Trio songs sound the exact same to me. <laughs> that's, that, no, that's totally accurate. Completely. Um, I never, and this isn't, I don't know if this is a hot take, but when a lot of people, the, the subgenre that a lot of people gravitated towards that liked these bigger bands, be it brand new or the movie life or whatever, they go to the more hardcore sound. They go sure. to like the yelling, you know, it, it went into the direction of what is not super affectionately called Screamo. So it's mm-hmm. like, the used it's glass jaw bands like that. And I it's, I'm not saying the used sound like glass jaw, but I really tried to like it. I really tried to like dudes swallowing microphones <laughs> and I would listen to it. And when I would try listening to it with who, you know, whether it was my girlfriend at the time, whether it was my friends, whether it was family, whoever it was, and I'd be listening to it and they would always like ask me the same question, which was pretty much just like, why are you listening <laughs> to just the guttural sounds of angry 22 year olds? And I never had a good answer for them until I realized that that sub genre is by and large trash. Trash. Yeah. I just glass jet. Like there are certain, like there are certain parts of those songs that are interesting, irrefutably interesting. But as soon as people started yelling for a reason I couldn't fully comprehend, I just, I have to just shrug and move on with my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Dan. Fair. I'm with you. I, 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 I gravitated towards that a little bit. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, w- I, I just, I wouldn't say it's trash. Like I always want people to enjoy what they like and that's fine. No, what they're to. they have the right to enjoy it. Sure. Like I have tons of friends who are like, you know, who are hardcore kids who, delved into emo stuff because it was, they felt some sensibilities with hardcore, but then when it got quieter or like, like those are the people who I like, couldn't get to listen, like for example, to death cab. Right. But that was more the angle from which I came and I was interested in emo bands. Right. Um, whereas, you know, I, I think if people like that, that's fine, but it was never for me. And, uh, I very like, like, I mean, I grew up on Long Island and I barely listened to glass jaw. It just was not my taste. Right. It, it just seemed like, I understand the catharsis of it all, sure. but people would listen to it at an insanely loud volume and then <laughs> go to shows and just beat the shit out of each other. And I was like, is this, is this who I am? <laughs> it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like you and it was not me. It just was not, it was yeah. not my cup of tea. I just but, wasn't but. about that bruise life. Yeah. <laughs> That's just, and that. now, and now you're about that bruise life though. Yes, that is true. B-R-E-W-S. B-E-R-E-W-S. Doesn't No Effects have a song, The Bruise, about my really? people? I feel like they do. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that is my thing where I was just like, listen, I tried, guys. It's just not for me. It's just, I don't get well, it. Don't knock it till you try it. That's all right. That's true. All right. That's all I got. That's all I got. That's it. We're That's out it. Of words. This has been, I think, 
one of our most important shows, Dan. <laughs> it's our legacy. <laughs> Surely a sponsor was not interested in paying for this content. No, 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 no. But we covered a lot of ground here, and I'm, I'm yeah. happy just to be part of it because I feel like you gentlemen have imparted so much wisdom on me personally. So thank you. Right. Oh, of course. Thanks to uh, Bill. And yeah, I'm so excited. And I'm excited in 10 years to come back and do the reunion show. <laughs> <laughs> but we will not talk about the reunion show on the reunion show. Not my favorite. Not, not your favorite fan. band. Um, Bill, where can everybody find you? Uh, I mean, on ESPN.com. I'm a football writer there. You can uh, download, listen to my podcast, The Bill Barnwell Show, which is supposed to be an NFL show, really more of a Bachelorette show at this point, <laughs> though, uh, ending shortly. And uh, on Twitter, if I've not blocked you already, you can find me at Bill Barnwell. <laughs> so easy. Unless I blocked you, in which case it's a lot harder. <laughs> that you will have to use a separate browser and then go to twitter.com slash Bill Barnwell and just don't sign up for an account there because he will know and block you there as well. <laughs> it has happened. So I'm sure yeah. it has. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Wow. So there you have it. Mm-hmm. The much anticipated emo pop punk show. Thank you, Bill Barnwell from ESPN.com. I think all we all learned ESPN. a lot. I did. I know I yeah. did. I'm raising my hand over here. I did. Yeah, I mean, I remember... Yeah, you can listen to the mixes on the Spotify uh, yeah. playlist that we release through our newsletter each week, which will start up again, hopefully, soon. Yeah, next couple I, weeks. I think we want to release a new shirt before the season begins. So we're going to yep. do another limited run of new, of new shirts, excuse me. Um, but man, that, that brought me back. That brought me back, Ty. I know what I'm listening to tonight. <laughs> what are you going to listen to? Everything from this era. Yeah. I'm yeah, trying to think weird. if I had like, I don't know. It probably is your favorite weapon, my favorite album. But uh, man, we just gave brand new so much advertising. Such a mismatch at our wise old age in our mid 30s. Yeah. I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to grill up some chicken. I'm going to mm-hmm. grill up some zucchini. I'll uh-huh. probably have some white wine with my lovely wife. And then I'm going to turn on Blink 182. Sure. Which album? I'm not sure yet. We'll just okay. see where the night takes us. Okay. Well, I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you, and you too. For that guy over there, Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildebrand, thanks again for tuning in to our solid verbal emo special. Off-topic bonus. Catch you all in a few days for our next preview. Stay solid. Peace. Peace.